Happy Sabbath, everyone. Uh, before we start our singing inspiration, we need a pianist. We can do it, huh? Hey, that's a brother. Hey, Jay, can you? Okay, before we start, let's uh, open uh, our inspiration with a prayer. Loving Father in heaven, thank you so much for this beautiful Holy Sabbath day that you've given to us. Thank you so much for being us here in the house of worship. And as we start our, our uh, the Sabbath school, may the Holy Presence be upon us. And may be with our uh, fellow brethren who are still on their way that they will arrive here safely. Lead us, to the, lead us today then, O oh Lord, and prepare our hearts for the blessings that we are we'll going to be receiving today. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In the book of Mark, uh, 1 verse 35, it says that, Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prays. Do you or will you wake up early in the morning to talk and seek Jesus? Let's sing, I will early seek the Savior, hymn number 539. In Job 12, 7 to 9, it says, But ask the beast, and they will teach you, the birds of the heavens, and they will tell you, or the voices of the earth, and it will teach. And the fish of the sea will declare to you, Who among all this does not know that the hand of the Lord has done? That's how God made the earth beautiful. Let's sing for the beauty of the earth, hymn number 565. For the love. 
Opening song, please stand and let's sing Trust and Obey. Five ninety. Let's pray. Our most gracious, dear, loving Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that uh, another Sabbath day has come into our lives. We are thankful, Lord, that uh, all your blessings you poured unto us during the past days of the week. 
We are thankful, Lord, that uh, we are enjoying health, our lives, although our health are not perfect, but we are still enjoying it. Thank you, Lord, for all these wonderful blessings, because you are our God who loves us in spite of our sinfulness. Please forgive us from any trespasses that we have done so that we will be worthy to receive the blessings that you are preparing to every one of us. Uh, help us to always trust in you and obey and obey your words because in trusting and obeying you blessings will be coming to us may your love and blessing be upon us all while we will patiently wait for you please bless also your children who are on their way to worship you in the beauty of your holiness keep them safe so we'll be joining together in worshiping your holy name uh, bless your people all around the world who are worshiping today. May we all be enriched in our spiritual life. Grant us your love now and forevermore. Forgive us from all trespasses. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, beloved brethren. Uh, I would like to extend my welcome to uh, all our viewers who are on uh, Facebook, Twitter, wherever you are. Happy Sabbath to all. Uh, if you notice our uh, program today, on my right side, is full of uh, seniors because this program is hosted by the senior group, the most beloved uh, brethren of this wonderful church. Right? And I'm now part of it. <laughs> That's why I was asked to uh, be the, uh, the welcomer of this program. So today's program, our Sabbath School program, February 10, 2024. Uh, we already had our uh, opening song, opening prayer, and now uh, we have a special fit here that will be led by uh, Sister Myrna Flores, uh, Sister Susan Dubak, uh, Nanay Consuelo de la Cruz, and uh, we also have a special song uh, that will be later uh, to be uh, given by uh, Faithful, Find Us Faithful by Class One. So I don't know which one is class one. I think class one is all seniors. So the uh, the uh, theme of our uh, program this morning is rekindling the flame. Rekindle. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, meaning. Rekindle means to frame up again, to start up again, to renew, to revitalize, and to revive. So whichever falls on your category, that's rekindle. Rekindling, rekindling the flame I read to you this, our passion for the Lord, which originates with the Holy Spirit, involves focusing on God's character. Before we proceed with our program, I would like to read to you uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. It says, passion to serve the Lord and share the gospel will ebb and flow throughout a believer's life. Some choose to settle for a lukewarm existence, neither risking much for his name, nor receiving many blessings. Others stop ministering altogether and drift aimlessly through life. But whenever we feel indifferent, we should try to rekindle the flame of passion that was first lit 
at the moment of salvation. When we were saved, we received the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the first step is to pray for the Holy Spirit to fill or control us afresh. That requires self-examination and repentance of any sins the Lord brings to mind. It also means giving back to God the right to reign over our life. Next, think about what was and what wasn't happening in life when passion last burned brightly. What external pressures and activities affected your ministry then and now? How can you prioritize such things wisely? Finally, devote a day or more to retreat and refocus on the Lord. Meditate on His words of encouragement, such as in Isaiah 41.10 says, This way, instead of fixating on our problems, we can remember He is our shepherd in every situation. The passion we experience at salvation can be ours again as we focus on the Lord. Uh, at this point of time, I would like to call our uh, one of our uh, invited participant, Nana Myrna, please come up. morning and happy Sabbath everyone. I was given a task of reading uh, a story which would relate to have our topic today. As I read this, I pray that we will all listen to the word of God that I am going to give to you. It says here, as I read in Romans 12, 16, it says here, show the same concern for everyone member or non-member and, and favor and non-member alike and don't be proud and or favor the rich or the poor and associate with the poor and repose them and respect them and don't keep thinking about how great you are. Our story comes to this point of, uh, of uh, verse because it is the story of Pocahontas. Our story brings us to the time of the child when we, still near. Okay. A beloved daughter of the chief Pohatan, Pohatan. Pocantas was born in Tidewater regions of coastal Virginia, USA. Her given name was um, Amon, Amonat and was given a secret personal name as Matuaka, which meant flowers between two streams. As a kid daughter of Chief Powhatan, she was his favorite among the daughters that he had for having 100 wives. When Pocahontas was 11 years old, being playful and was free enough to roam about the village of Jamestown, Jamestown uh, she met the colony settlers leader, John Smith, she began to make friends with the settlers. Among the settlers that she friend befriended was the leader, John Smith. And as they have been going as friends, she went to the settlers' place and was bringing food for them because they were in an area where they cannot, where they had limited sources at the time. 
And while they were friends, Jan Smith started teaching Pacohantas, Pocahantas, how to speak English. And in the same way, she did teach also Jan Smith for her language. One day, her brother of Pacohantas kidnapped Jan Smith and dragged Jan Smith to his father, and he expected to persecute Jan Smith by clubbing his head. When he was taken as a, as a captive, the brother placed two big stones in order for John Smith to lie down and put his head at the middle of the two big stones. When Pawatan, the chief, came and, and saw that John Smith was, uh, was already laid for, uh, for persecution, uh, without much uh, word, Pakuhantas ran and leapt onto the body of Jan Smith and put her head over the head of uh, Jan Smith and told his father, if you are going to kill Jan Smith, kill me with him. At that action, the, the father, Chief Pautan, was so touched that so, so that action, he had to release the prisoner, John Smith. And when he was released, John uh, Pohatan was the first to escort John Smith to the area of the settlers. When he was there, the, the settlers began to negotiate with the tribe of Pautan to, re to release all the uh, prisoners that they, they have taken. And because of that negotiation that it took a lot of time, they had to hostage Pakuhantas and placed her in a prison. When Pakuhantas was already uh, stay, uh, hostage to the, uh, to the settlers, they placed her in a prison. And from the prison, they have had a pastor uh, wet taker uh, Alexander Whitetaker, who took the chance of reaching out to Pakuhantas and used the Bible in teaching her and making her understand how the love of God would be with her. And then, through those teachings, while she was in prison, she suddenly embraced her, embraced the Christian faith. And when she was already embracing the Christian faith, she was released from prison, and then she was baptized and then she was given the name Rebecca. Given the name of Rebecca, one of the settlers, a farmer, who is Rolf, uh, John Rolf, married her at a very young age. When they got married, John Rolf and Pakuhantas were able to have one child, a child named uh, Thomas. Yeah, and in the establishment of their of their reunion as the colonists and the natives, it established peace between them. And we all know that from this lesson, we all live together despite of differences, the culture and values, being different from each other, accepting the truth that we all walk in the same order in despite of differences. While in Pakuhanta's marriage, the family went to visit London and when they were in London, uh, they were welcomed and met by King James I, the first, and they were welcomed in London society. At the time that the Pakuhantas were planning to go back to Jamestown uh, in Tide Water region, she got ill. And when she got ill, her last words was, all must die and let thy son live it. We go back to the uh, we go back to the uh, theme of the of Romans twelve sixteen. Okay, show they say the same concern for everyone, member or non-member alike, and don't be proud, and favor the rich, and associate with the poor and respect them, and don't keep thinking about how great you are. Don't get 
don't get your own with uh, don't get even don't get even with someone who does you wrong you do what is right as far as humanly possible try to get along with everyone and god will bless each and every one of us god bless everyone <laughs> Praise God, we're all here safely. Good morning. Psalms 37, 4. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desire of your heart. Jeremiah 1, 5. Before I formed in the belly, I knew thee. And before you camest forth out of the womb, I sanctify thee, and I ordain thee a prophet unto the nations. I'm not a prophet. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a teacher. I'm just me. My childhood days was mostly living in poverty. My father was a jeepney driver. That means when the jeep breaks down, we all broke down. No food to eat. Worst thing was mama was always pregnant every year. <laughs> there was time when we had only one cup of cooked rice for the six of us. Mom would bring that to us, that one cup cook of rice, put a little pinch of salt which she only has and the six of us would put our finger right down. We actually called it a period, means nothing else. And besides mom's role of having babies, she teaches us big time of being resilient. She would say, we have no land to tell. Look back, there's only ocean. During low tide, go and dig clams, anything you find. Sell it around the neighborhood that I can buy rice for us. So it was our weekly routine. Before going to school or after school when it's low tide, on Saturdays, we're selling fresh fish. And I'm telling you, the smell of the mud and the <coughs> smell of the fish would not fade, even though how much I was myself with bar soap and the Tide, if you remember, Tide powder, that's my shampoo. <laughs> Life was bitter, and this draws me to see, seek shelter, to seek God, faithfully go to church on Sundays and pray it's morning and evening. I did not like much the seven repetitions of Hail Mary, in my rosary, but I like most of the five repetitions of the Lord's Prayer. It was like I was being con connected to God. I was always wanting to become a nun, Mis a mission that I could help people, and to be with se in seclusion, just a monga. Who is Cebuano here? You know what is monga? Only the hands that be seen. A young child, that was I always wanted to do. I must, it must have been God's providence that one day I found the writing of Apostle Paul when I followed my mom after his reading of the pamphlet. It was about the story life of Paul's conversion and his suffering and that he died. And then there was also the story of Jesus who was nailed to the cross. I actually stole that novena, that little booklet. And I hid myself inside a little room where I put that, you know, that linukot na banig, the big mat. I was inside 
reading it faithfully, read it and read it all over again. I remember I was in tears. I was not an Adventist, I was a Catholic. And I said to my prayer, Lord, if Paul died, if he suffered and he died, so be it. You were nailed to the cross, I'll die, so be it. I did not know what I have to go through. Then, what lies ahead of me? Because of poverty, and I could not stand anymore being in the same place, I moved out from Cebu to Manila. And I found a job in Buting, Pasig Rizal. I don't know who else comes from Pasig here. As a worker, I was a storekeeper. I managed a little bit, a little store. It was year 1971. Life was better then. I could, I could at least eat proper food, and I was able to send money to my parents. That time, they, they were already, how many of them? Um, I would say probably eight or nine. Nine in numbers. Psalms 23 verse four, the verse most fitted for my story this morning, it says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I did not know back then about this verse. Year 1973, those daily news headlines of raped, dead bodies of women being dumped in canals. And that one Saturday night, a customer, a man friend, told me, Susan, do not go out early morning alone. It's risky. His name was Virgilio, called it Beloy. I'll never forget that name. <clears throat> so he was the last customer, and when he left, I closed the store and counted the sales of the day. And I went inside the house because the store is just inside the compound. My plan was always like this. The same, every early, early Sunday, Sunday, I would attend the first mass, then go to the market. So early morning at 4.30, early Sunday, I opened the gate and I looked around and no one was around. So I went out. I walked just few distance from the house and I noticed someone was walking behind me. I did not look back because I had always that in my mind. I love God. I worship him faithfully. I have no enemy. So I didn't look back. I kept walking and the presence of someone behind me was getting closer. Then all at once it happened, I felt the strong man's arms on me. I think I'll just say it in Tagalog. He just, nilagay niya yung arms niya dito, locked me up both of my arms here, that I could not move. And his other, and then his other hand was on my mouth that I could not scream. I was not scared. And I said, Wag mga akong lukuhin biloy means, don't make me fall out of me biloy. So I said, the man then said, and the man then had his knife on my chin and said, jami mong daldala means, you talk too much, huh? Give me your money. And that's when I realized that I was in the hands of a stranger, held up at knife point. Yet I was not scared, so I said, oh, you want my money? Here it is. So I threw it, go pick it up. That's my voice. And this angered him. He then dragged me to the ground and made me pick up the purse. Then he walked, walked me towards, him and me, we were walking towards a secluded area. So 
I was tightly chicken by him with a knife here and walk towards the secluded area. Because the thing is, uh, we were, this is my employer's house, this is the road where tricycles always drive, you know, pick up passengers. This is the open field and there is the secluded area. Big trees and kawayan bushes. I was thinking when I was walking, as, as he said, Keith was telling me, Papatayin kita. I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna kill you. I was not scared of that. My mind was too busy thinking to apply the self defense. My brother told me back home it's a judo karate. How can I match this man, right? But my thinking, my thought, I could block his leg, throw him on the ground, then what? And he kept on saying, Papa Tain Kita. When we reached to the, so anyway, for sure in my mind, I would not give up. I will die, but I have to fight. To scream for help was impossible. I was like gagged by his hand and the smell of grease, grease was suffocating. The man's, the man's grip on me was strong enough to overpower my thoughts, and I had peace of surrender. Surrendering myself, I was not afraid to die. I could not even call in God to help me out. So we arrived at the area where he was going to kill me. He then pushed me to the ground and kneeled on my two legs over, he was on me, and his knees was, his two legs was on my knees, and raised the knife. In an instant, in calm voice, I said, I know you have family, and I know God is looking at what you're about to do. I would say God must have his angel watching over me, and God must have put these words, those words in my mind. Soon as I was done talking to him, the man pulled himself away from me, knife was still in his hand. This is where I saw his curly hair and his face covered with black, black bandana. He pulled me up and spun me around and told me to run straight and not to look back, not to scream, because he will be following me and will kill me. I ran and ran, not knowing the direction. And about halfway, I heard the honking of the boss, the jeepneys. So I took off the bandana, and I found myself in Baron Transit Terminal. I ran towards the road, back to the house. I was lucky I came back alive, was not raped, as the neighbors and my employer's words. I was lucky to be alive. Weeks, months passed. I would receive calls from that stranger, say, same voice saying, Susan, papatayin kita. How would he know my name? How did he know our numbers at the home? We didn't have cell phone those times. So I decided to move out. That was my story, a scary story. 1980, I finally forgot my Bible. Where is my Bible? It's here. See, I'm become forgetful. Finally found my Bible. I longed to have this when I was only nine years old. I asked my the priest in the town if I could read the Bible, if I could he always has this big Bible in the you know in the altar. I always ask him if I could borrow the Bible, he would tell me, no, no one is allowed to read. Finally, in 1980, I found a Bible I longed to have. This led me towards God. Had Bible studies, 
and become who I am today, like you. It, I would say, um, circumstances, God allows that to happen in our lives for his own purpose. That's what I know, that's what I believe. I remember always this song, and I like this song. He lives, Christ lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. As I said, I'm not a culprator anymore. I'm not a pastor, not a teacher. But if it would cost my life to witness for God, so be it. God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Elizabeth Elliot is one of our evangelists to Ecuador in the year 1926 to 2015. Brave and adventurous Elizabeth Howard was only 12 when she attended Wheaton College, where she studied classical Greek, hoping to translate the New Testament for unreached people groups. She married Jim Elliot in 1953. They joined four other families in the mission field in Ecuador. While living with a peaceful Quetza tribe, Jim attempted to make contact with the Waurani, a violent tribe known for their savage killings. Neighboring tribes called them Aukas or savages. When Jim and four others were killed, Elizabeth insisted, this is not a tragedy. God has a plan and purpose in all of this. Together with Rachel Saint, the sister of one of the other murdered missionaries, Elizabeth took her toddler Valerie to the Waurani village, where they lived for two years in a tiny rain-swept hut, eating roasted monkey limbs and other local fare. She hoped that by forgiving those who had killed her husband, she might teach them about God's mercy and grace. Her courageous faith won several in the tribe to faith in Christ and inspired millions of Christians around the world. When Elizabeth returned to the United States in 1963, the Waurani were no longer a violent culture. Elizabeth married again and began her speaking ministry across the United States. She also wrote 24 books, many of them inspirational bestsellers. Today, the tribes evangelized continues to grow in the Christian faith. Thank you so much, uh, the three uh, beautiful participants. That was a uh, beautiful story or testimony. So uh, I hope you uh, learned a lesson from that, that uh, whatever we do, God has a plan for us. We, well, we, it's not our own doing, but there is a living God that guides us. And uh, if you, uh, I've listened to those uh, stories. It, maybe you encounter that in your life. But the, the moral of the story is that let us all be faithful because there is God who is waiting for us and to uh, that we worship Him. And as time, would like to invite our class one to please come up and let us all sing our special song. Uh, the special song is Find Us Faithful. Find us faithful. 
Karen. Karen. Miss Karen. Ati Febi. Kuya Melchor. Ati Nene. Kuya Efren. No. I'm just mentioning the, the members of the, the, the seniors of this uh, beloved church.
At this point of time, I would like to uh, call on our uh, facilitators, our uh, school, uh, um, Sabbath school teachers, to please uh, stand up and we'll pray. Let's pray. Our most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for our Sabbath program. Lord, uh, at this moment, we would like to lift up to you our uh, facilitators for each class. Lord, be with them. Uh, may their words be all your words, Lord. And I pray for our uh, beloved brethren, uh, members of the classes, that they uh, may open their mind, their hearts, and ears to be able to uh, learn from this uh, lesson. Lord, uh, thank you for the Sabbath once again, and uh, we ask for the forgiveness of our shortcomings. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome back. We are studying the Sabbath school lessons on the Psalms. If you've joined us in our previous studies, you recognize that there's a central theme through the Psalms, and that theme is the honest, open-hearted prayers of the psalmists seeking God with, when there's evil and suffering all around them. The Psalms do not deny the reality of human suffering, but the Psalms present a God who's there in human suffering, a God who's always present with his people, and a God that will one day bring suffering to the end. In our lesson today, it's entitled, I Will Arise. The theme text comes from Psalm 12 and verse 5. Let's take a look at that psalm, Psalm 12, verse 5, says this, For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, ah, now I will arise, says the Lord. Notice God says, I'm going to arise. The poor are being oppressed. The needy are sigh sighing and crying out. But God says, I'm going to arise. I will be their defender. I will be their protector. Now, in ancient Jewish culture, the thought was that poverty was a sign of God's displeasure and riches were a sign of God's favor. And what the psalmist is saying is that poverty is not a sign of God's displeasure at all. People may be poor because of the circumstances of their life. They may be poor because of the environment that they were brought up in. They may be poor because of the, of the context in which they've had to try to flourish. So poverty is not a sign of God's displeasure at all. In fact, God takes special concern. He has special care for the poor. And here in this lesson, it says, uh, second to last paragraph under the Sabbath afternoon's lesson, only the Creator, whose throne is founded on righteousness and justice, can provide with His sovereign judgment stability and prosperity to the world. The twofold aspect of divine judgment includes deliverance of the oppressed and destruction of the wicked. So, what this lesson is all about is this. God's concern or care for the poor, our as Christians care for the poor, helping to meet their needs, and the reality of the fact that because God is righteous, one day he will deliver the poor, the needy. One day they'll live in a land where there is no more want, no more suffering, no more heartache or death. And one day the wicked who've oppressed the poor, one day they will be destroyed. So Sunday's lesson is entitled, The Majestic Warrior. Psalm 18, verse 3 says, I'll call upon the Lord. Verse 18 says, the Lord is my support. Psalm 76, verse 9 says, God arose in judgment to deliver the oppressed. Uh, Psalm 144, 5 to 7 says, rescue me, deliver me, O God. These psalms, according to the first paragraph in our lesson, 
praise the Lord for his awesome power over the evil forces that threaten his people. They portray God in his majesty as warrior and judge. Now, the image of God as warrior is frequent in the Psalms. It highlights the severity and urgency of God's response to his people's cries and suffering. So this idea, God is is warrior. He comes to make war on evil. He comes to defend his people. He comes as the mighty leader who will bring to his people encouragement and hope, who will destroy the powers of wickedness. And there are very fascinating, very fascinating allusions to God. In Psalm 18, for example, verse 13 to 15, look at some of those allusions to God. Let's look at verse 13. They're quite interesting. The Lord thundered in the heavens. You know, you think of this rolling thunder. The Lord thunders in the heavens. And the Most High uttered his voice. Hailstones, coals of fire. He sent his arrows, scattered the foe. Lightnings in abundance. He vanquished them. Then the channels of waters were seen. The foundations of the world were uncovered. At your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of your nostrils. You notice all the different allusions to God's power there. Thunder, hailstone, coals of fire, lightning, channels of water. Gods are called God's rebuke. In other words, he is the mighty warrior. And although evil may prevail, it reminds me of James Russell Lowell's poem, Truth Forever on the Scaffold long forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown stands God, keeping watch above his own. Evil may not always be judged quickly, and it won't be, but it will be judged. God's people may not always see apparent deliverance, but they will be delivered by his grace and through his power. Down here, third paragraph down, about the third sentence down in the paragraph, in his many battles against the enemies of God's people. King David praised God as the only one who achieved all the victories. It would have been easy for David to take credit for what happened, for his many successes and triumphs, but that was not his frame of mind. He knew where the source of his power came from. In the battle against evil, in the battle against wickedness, it's not our strength, but it's God's strength. It's not our ability to triumph over evil. It's God's ability to triumph through us over evil. For he, as Sunday's lesson is entitled, is the majestic warrior. Now, one day, Monday's lesson, there'll be justice for the oppressed. If you've looked up every one of those texts, there are five texts that are, six texts, actually, that are given in our lesson. In Psalm 9, verse 18, the needy are not forgotten. In Psalm 12, verse 5, God rises up to support the needy. In Psalm 40, God again uh, triumphs over the powers of hell. And David says, I'm poor and needy, but it's God who's my deliverer. In Psalm 113, 7, uh, David prays, raise the poor out of dust. Psalm 146. Now, I want to look at Psalm 146 with you. And so if you happen to be following along in your Bible, turn to Psalm 146, and we want to take a look at that particular psalm that talks about God's power and God's deliverance. Psalm 146, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, praise the Lord. I'll sing praises to God while I have by being. Don't put your trust in princes nor in the Son of Man where there's no health. Why not? His spirit or his breath departs. He returns to the earth. In other words, he's going to die. Where's my hope? Happy, verse 5, happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever, who executes justice. The Lord opened, verse 8, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who bowed before him. The Lord loves righteousness. He watches over the strangers. What does he do? Strangers. He, the, he watches over them. He relieves the father, this, and the widow. But the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. So here, 
in these Psalms in, in Monday's lesson, it talks about that God is going to reign justice for the oppressed. The expression poor and needy is not limited, second paragraph of Monday's lesson, to material poverty, but signifies vulnerability, helplessness. The expression appeals to God's compassion. It conveys the idea that the sufferer is alone and has no other help but God. The depiction poor and needy also pertains to one's sincerity, truthfulness, and love for God in confessing one's total dependence on God and renouncing any trace of self-reliance and self-assertion. So all of us, in a sense, are poor and needy. We're poverty-stricken for righteousness. We are needy for the strength of God. And here, in this psalm, God promises to be with the poor and the needy. The poor and needy who are physically poor and need, in need of material things, but those of us who are spiritually poverty-stricken. In Tuesday's lesson, the title becomes, How Long Will You Judge Unjustly? Psalm 82 was, is a very interesting psalm. When I first read it, it was difficult for me to understand, honestly. I had to pour over it a number of times, pray over it, to understand it. Look. In Psalm 82, verse 1, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. How long would judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and the needy. Free from the hand of the wicked. Now, the part that confused me is he judges among the gods. What is that talking about? When you understand that the Bible talks at times about the leaders being in the place of God. And what this is talking about is that here you have leadership that has assumed the role of God, but God is the only rightful ruler of the universe. He is the sovereign one who reigns from his throne in the sanctuary, and these so-called quote-unquote gods are false gods, false leaders, and they'll be judged. The lesson points this out very nicely, I think, second to last paragraph, Tuesday's lesson. Psalm 82 mockingly exposes the apostasy of some leaders who believe themselves to be gods above other people. See, so when it says he judges among the gods, these leaders are, they believe themselves that they're higher than the people, that they're like the gods. Although God gave the authority and privilege to the Israel leaders to be called the children of the Most High, and to represent them. God renounces the wicked leaders. God reminds them that they're mortal, subject to the same moral laws as all people. No one is above God's law. God will judge the entire world. So here in Psalm 82, in uh, Tuesday's lesson, it points out that leaders who think that they have the authority of God and who treat people unjustly and who oppress the poor, they will be judged by God. He will pour out, Wednesday's lesson, his indignation. Psalm 58, 6 to 8, Psalm 69 particularly. Let's look at Psalm 69, verses 22 to 28. Psalm 69, verses 22 to 28. And here's this, what the scripture says. Let their table become a snare before them. That's a table of the wicked, those that oppress the poor, and their well-being a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and make their loins shake continually. <laughs> Pour out your indignation upon them. Let your wrathful anger take hold of them. Let, your habitation be, let their habitation be desolate. Let no one dwell in their tents. Verse 28. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. So here, Wednesday's lesson talks about David's prayer that the wicked one day be ultimately destroyed. God has reached out to them. God has sought them. God has sent his Holy Spirit to their heart. God has brought conviction to them, but they've rebelled. They've turned their back on God, and they've oppressed the poor. Um, second paragraph down in Wednesday's lesson. Yet the psalmist's indignation in the face of oppression is a good one. It means that the psalmist took right and wrong more seriously than did many people. 
He cares even greatly about the evil that's done in the world, not just to himself, but to others also. Last paragraph, last couple of sentences. Wednesday's lesson. Divine judgment obliges God's people to raise their voices against all evil and seek the coming of God's kingdom in its fullness. The Psalms also give voice to those who suffer, letting them know that God is aware of their suffering and one day justice will come. So this lesson this week talks about really two or three things that I think that are vital truths. One, as Christians, we have responsibility to minister to those around us who are poor. They can be poor and needy spiritually, and we can minister to them. They can be poor and needy from a material standpoint, and we can minister to them. So they can be poor and needy in a variety of ways. So the first lesson, I think, from this week's study is have a compassionate, sensitive heart to the people around you that are poor and needy. The second lesson is that God is a mighty warrior and he will judge the wicked who oppress the poor and needy and eventually they'll be blotted out of his book and eventually destroyed forever. The third lesson is that God is with the poor and needy to encourage them and to strengthen them. And that leads us to Thursday's lesson, the Lord's judgment in the sanctuary. Psalm 96, God judges earth from his sanctuary. Psalm 99, God reigns between the cherubims. Psalm 132, the Lord has chosen Zion as his habitation. I do want to look at Psalm 132. Psalm 132, verse 7 to verse 9. We'll take a look at that. It talks about God's judgment from his sanctuary. Psalm 132, verse 7. Let us go to his tabernacle. Let us go to his tabernacle. David says, look, there's a lot going on in the world. I'm being, David says, I'm being pursued by Saul and his forces. Uh, death seems to be inevitable for me. I'm poverty stricken. I, I have a, a rock for my pillow as I sleep out under the stars. My body at times is racked with pain. But David says, let's go to his, his sanctuary. Let's worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place, you in the ark of your strength. Yet your priests be clothed with righteousness. Your saints shout for joy for, you, for your servant David's sake. And do not turn your face from the anointed. And then he comes down here and he says, The Lord has chosen Zion, verse 13. He has desired it for his habitation. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I'll satisfy her poor with bread. David says, by faith. David says, by faith. By faith, I will rest in the sanctuary. By faith, I will dwell in the pavilion of God. By faith, my heart will rest in the joy of his grace in the tabernacle above. David says, I will not allow the things around me to discourage me. Second paragraph, Thursday's lesson. At the sanctuary, the plan of salvation was revealed. That's revealed to David. In paganism, sin was revealed and understood primarily as a physical stain to be eliminated by magic rites. In contrast, the Bible presents sin as a violation of God's moral law. God's holiness means that he loves justice and righteousness. Likewise, God's people should pursue justice and righteousness and should worship in his holiness. To, that, they must, to do that, they must keep God's law. In other words, as we're changed by grace and transformed by his love, as we're led to obedience to his law, we have a compassion for the poor. We have a love for those that are needy. We have a concern for those who are less fortunate than we are. But one day, we know that the God who forgives, that God will come again. He will defeat all evil. Righteousness will reign forever and ever and ever. Friday's lesson, the Psalms oblige people to raise their voices against evil and to seek the coming of God's kingdom in its fullness. 
In the Psalms, we're given the assurance of divine comfort and deliverance. The Lord will arise. The Lord will arise. When you feel somewhat discouraged or downhearted, know that the Lord will arise. When sickness ravages your body and you feel weak and fainting, almost near death, know the Lord will arise. When you look out over the world and see the suffering and the heartache and the sorrow and the disappointment, know that the Lord will arise. He will arise to strengthen you. He will arise to encourage you. He will arise to give you hope. He will arise in judgment to come again, destroy evil, and restore all of his people to the divine glory that they had before sin so that they can reign with him and live with him forever and ever and ever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the encouraging ministry of the Psalms. We thank you if for the solutions to this divine mystery that there will be evil and wickedness. But the ultimate solution is to see you in the sanctuary, to know your presence, to sense that you're with us, that you'll never leave us or forsake us. We thank you and praise you for everything that you have done for us and everything you will do. In Christ's name, amen.
Good everyone. Good morning. Welcome everyone to uh, Vancouver Filipino Estate Church. We are so glad you are with us today as we worship the Lord together in the house of God. And for those who join us uh, today by uh, internet, welcome to our worship this Sabbath morning. We are going to have a time of worship shortly, but first we would also like to extend a warm welcome to our visitors. I uh, I checked the list there. It's just one name there. It's who is uh, Ara Del Mundo? Hi, welcome to our church. We're so glad uh, for joining us in our worship today. Is there any more visitors that I haven't seen the names on the guest book? Ah, uh, so. I see those people there up at the back of Elder Ron. Can you introduce yourself? What's your name? Wow, welcome to our church. We'd like to welcome all of the members of this church and also the regular visitors as well. Thank you once again for coming to worship with us today, but please look around and see how blessed we are today to be gathered with all these beautiful people. And now it's your turn to your... Uh, now, turn to your neighbors and offer a warm greeting to everyone. I give you one minute. I have here uh, some announcements. This is for uh, church board members. We, are, uh, we will have meeting next Saturday, February 17, 5.30 p.m. here at the church. Next Saturday, church board meeting. Another one is uh, we have uh, pre-health evangelism training starts today at 2.30 to 5 p.m. Uh, to be held at assembly room Deer Lakes Day School. All interested are invited to attend. So if you want to learn how to do Bible study, this is the time. If you have friends and families that you think that they want to learn how to uh, learn to conduct Bible study, this is the time. Actually, this uh, health evangelism training is composed of uh, series, many series, many topics. And this, this one is the first session. And the topic is how to give Bible study. 
We have more announcements on the bulletin. I just uh, read the, the topic is so that if you are interested, you may go to the bulletin, the printed bulletin, and get the details. So we have Global Youth Today, uh, no, Global Youth Day for the youth on March 16, 2024. And we also have um, uh, promotional uh, ads here, like if you want to be a teacher in the future, there's a scholarship program that is list listed here. You want, uh, if you want to know more, just uh, uh, take a look on this printout. BC Camp 2024 in Camp Hope, the Children's Division is looking for a leader for the five to six division and children's class. So just send your resume to sbuchanan at bcadventist.ca and as we enter our worship today the hour of worship i want uh, our our uh, speaker for today is no other than our uh, church uh, youth pastor pastor neil batyan sila we have he, uh, we have him here for about like two years, so we are so happy uh, for the things that that he's doing for our youth and for our church. And his message is entitled "Message of Hellfire." Now let's focus our minds and hearts to this opportunity that we're still able to worship and praise the Lord. Please put away any kind of distractions. Please turn up or put into silent mode your phones and any devices to avoid distraction to others and to yourself too. In Psalms 135, uh, verses one to three, it says here, praise the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. Praise Him, O you servants of the Lord, you who stand in the house of the Lord, in the courts of the house of our God. Amen. John 14 verse 3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. For our next two songs, we will be singing Just Over the Mountains, followed by SJ Hymnal 626, In a Little While We're Going Home.
us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for gathering us all here this morning. We ask for your Holy Spirit to build this room so that we can be attuned to your voice and to your word for this morning. Thank you, Father, for hearing and answering our prayer. We ask in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> today is allocated for Canadian Media Outreach. Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada has placed a special emphasis on proclaiming the three angels' messages through media. In uh, 2003, Hope Channel began broadcasting in North America. Since then, Hope Channel has grown into a global network of over 80 channels in as many languages. From Iceland to the Cook Islands, from Sweden to Zambia, and from Brazil to China, Hope Channels are sharing the good news of Christ's love for all. On March 1st, 2024, the Hope Channel Network will grow by one more member, Hope Channel Canada with a distinctive visual identity in a growing number of programs produced in Canada by Canadians for Canadians. Hope Channel Canada will be the home for every media ministry affiliated with the SDACC, such as It Is Written Canada, 
Voice of Prophecy Canada, VOAR, Lighthouse FM, and others. It will be a comprehensive media undertaking available on cable, on the web, through, not, through the mobile app and the Roku app, speaking to different demographics through various media. You are invited to become an agent of hope by giving generously to support our commitment to meet Canadians where they are, speaking to the real needs of viewers from every cross-section of society looking for answers to questions about faith, healthy living, prophecy, Bible study, relationships, and community. Your offering today will help further the work of media ministries across Canada, helping viewers, listeners, and Bible, Bible students to find freedom, healing, and hope in Jesus. Our deacons are ready to serve us today.
God is with us today. He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So he is inviting everyone who wants to bring all of your cares in your life. Please come forward and surrender all to him. So I invite everyone who wants to come forward. Sister Karen Malayari will lead us to the garden of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today in your house to worship, honor, and to thank you for everything that you have given us and for waking us today. Pray, please, Lord, we humbly ask you to give us the strength, courage, and determination to face the uncertainties of our everyday life. We lift up to you um, our different prayer requests you know our heart's deepest desires and needs. We ask that you hear our silent cries and petitions. Most especially, Lord, we ask that you place your healing hands on those who suffer from different medical problems and bestow wisdom to those who are struggling with decisions and guide those who are facing with difficulties in life. Lord, we pray that you would fill our hearts with peace and assurance, knowing that you are with us every step of the way. Dear God, we pray for our speaker, that he may be filled with your Holy Spirit and, you, and that you anoint his words. And we ask that you speak to us through the, your servant and that your words enter deep into our souls. Heavenly Father, our hearts are full of gratitude we thank you for being the source of all our blessings. As we present our tithes and offerings, multiply them and use them to further your work. May this gift extend the work of your kingdom in your church, our community, and throughout the world you have lovingly created. God, thank you for your abundant love and care for us. We know that everything comes from you, from your plans, in your time frame and for that we are so incredibly grateful thank you for forgive us, forgiving us from all of our sins even those we do not realize we commit we ask these things from the name in the name of your son jesus christ amen, amen.
Can I call all the children to the front, please? I'm looking at you, Jillian. Yep. We only have two today? Oh, downstairs? Anyone else downstairs? Can all the children come upstairs, please? It's okay, I can start, I can start. Oh, should I wait, should I wait? Okay. <laughs> yeah, Josiah. Yeah, Kuya Simon. Tito Renz, okay. Oh, yay, oh yeah, sorry, me too. There we go, there we go. All right. So, how many of you guys know what this is? What? Josiah, you know what it is? What is it? Sandal, yeah, flip-flops or chinelas, right? Right? I'll give, uh, I'll give someone here, if you wear this for the rest of the church service, I'll give you a prize. Who wants to wear it? Yeah? You're, there? You're gonna win a really good prize. If not, that's, a fi that's fine, if not. Well, um, how many of you guys wear these outside, especially at the beach during the summertime? Yeah? A lot of you? Okay, okay. How about at home? You wear chinelas at home? Yeah? Okay. Uh, back in my days, I wore them on my butt, okay? Because I used to get palo, okay? <laughs> but you can wear chinelas just about anywhere, and it feels good to have them on, you know? Feel the air between your toes. There are a lot of good things about chinelas, right? But there are a few bad things, okay? For example, how clean are your feet after a long day at the beach? You know, you got like water and sand and mud. Yeah, Jethro. How clean are they? Can you eat off of them? Can you eat your rice off of it? No. Yeah, no, right? Okay. Well, yeah, they're obviously gonna be dirty, right, after the day. In Jesus' time, though, they didn't have shoes or socks, right? Everyone who could afford shoes wore sandals, okay? You can imagine what a stinky mess that would be, right? Yeah, stinky, yeah. In fact, it was such a mess that a tradition was formed, okay? You were invited, if you were invited to someone's house, one of the servants would wash your feet, okay? So it's, it's, it's clean inside. That's why we don't wear shoes inside, right? Yeah. Do you think there were many servants volunteering for that job? No, right? Probably not. We've already established just how dirty people's feet could get, okay? Who would wanna wash the feet of 20, 30, 50, or 100 people? Jillian, do you want to wash people's feet? No. A hundred people's feet? No. How about one person? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. wow. Okay. Do you think the principal of your school would do that for your class? No. What? No? no. Okay, are you going to ask this time? Huh? Okay, maybe not. Do you, think, do you think the Prime Minister of Canada will wash the feet of his dinner guests? How about the CEO of Minecraft? No. Maybe not, maybe not, yeah. Well, washing feet was a servant's work and only the lowliest of servants were made to do it. So when Jesus got on his knees and washed the feet of his disciples, it was a big deal, okay? Jesus was their teacher, their master. They had everything, or they'd left everything to follow him. He was more important than a principal or even a prime minister or even a CEO of Minecraft would be to us. They truly believed that he was the son of God, okay? So seeing the, seeing, uh, the man that they believed was the Messiah washed their feet, sent a powerful message to the disciples, and sends a powerful message to us too, okay? Jesus is the king of kings, and if the king of kings would wash the feet of his own students, 
How should we treat our friends? How should we treat our neighbors and even our enemies? Bad? Uh oh. To washing feet is a dirty job. It was one of the dirtiest jobs a servant could do, but it was not too dirty for Jesus. Okay? If Jesus was willing to wash the feet of men who are his followers, we need to be willing to serve others the same way. Right? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being a servant to man. Help us be servants to one another. Amen. For our scripture reading, I'm inviting the congregation to please stand up and open your Bibles with you and find the book 1 John 4, verse 18. I'm reading from the New International Version. It says here, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Thank you. Please be seated. It does. 
doesn't matter if we agree. All he asks is that we serve him faithfully and love us he first love us. He made us in his image and in his eyes we are all the same. And though our methods they may be that will remain in our hearts we're one divided worshiping one savior one lord in our hearts we're one divided All right. It didn't really register to me that we're already in February. I feel like January went by pretty fast. And it's only a matter of time before this year, you know, concludes as well. And as the saying goes, we are in some ways one month closer, or by the end of the year, one year closer to Christ's return, right? Well, when I would hear stuff like that when I was little, I was kind of worried because as a child, there was like so many things I still wanted to experience and, you know, do. Because there's certain things like as a child, you're not like able to do as well, like, you know, finish school, get a job or, you know, do all, all kinds of other things though. But as I grew older, that didn't really um, scare me as much though. But something else kind of concerned me when we talk about the end times or talk about hellfire, fire and brimstone, all these types of things, the destruction of the wicked, all these things, and, you know, think about persecution, the last days, right? Before we continue, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you for this time, this moment that we can be together to um, be in your word. Speak through me, Lord, that you will um, speak to each and every one of us, including me. Bless us, Lord, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so again, growing up, and especially when it came to evangelistic meetings, I did not like it, mainly because when I would hear evangelism or evangelistic meeting, there was particular topics that were like exclusively mentioned, at least to me, which was, you know, the end times, the last days, and books that were only um, read through exclusively from Daniel or Revelation, right? That's kind of like a little bit of the main um, gist of some certain like evangelistic meetings. But at the end, we would still have a considerable amount of people who would give their lives to Christ and who would, you know, be baptized at the end of the day or at the end of these um, meetings, pretty much. But I also remember a time when my brother would um, sometimes recount of this certain individual that we had at church. And this person would try to emphasize death in connection with not following Christ. So essentially along the lines of like you say, 
this person would be saying like, you know, unless you give your life to Christ, you're gonna die. You, you know, you don't know what's gonna happen the next day. This could be your last day, that type of thing. And like, there's so much emphasis on, you know, this life and death situation. And in some sense, it is pretty true, right? We don't know what's gonna happen in the future. At like, no matter how much we plan, no matter how much we project maybe few months or a few years into the future, like it's pretty uncertain, right? We don't know what might happen. And that's why I think the decision or like these notions of trying to get people to give their lives to Christ with like the urgency of saying like, hey, you know, like, you know, decide now before it's too late type of thing, you know? And then we, we hear the close of probation and that's kind of like one of the nails on the coffin. It's like, okay, like, you know, maybe I need to make a decision right here, right now. I gotta do something. But I believe that what this does, what this breeds is fear in our messages, in the way that we proclaim Christ. We proclaim what we call the good news, the gospel, right? And it's not only this person that would, you know, sometimes it could be misunderstood, you know, it's pretty easy to just label individuals like this who are just you know, very, you know, like, you don't know anything, you know, you don't have any um, consideration or some kind of respect, you know, but, and again, it would be so easy to kind of just like dunk on this type of behavior where the emphasis is so much on, you know, if you don't give your life to Christ, you're going to die, you know, and then, or going out on the street with a microphone and saying, you know, like, the end is coming, you know, repent and all this stuff, but, and sometimes some people don't like that, you know, unsolicited urgency as such though. But what we're gonna try to do is to try to understand things behind this message and maybe why people kind of do the things that they do regarding this. When I looked into the Bible, I thought of at least almost like a few um, characters that have like these similar um, ways of just portraying the end of the world or it's like similar to like the Armageddon. And the first person that came to mind was Noah. So in the book of Genesis, when the antediluvians were kind of just like doing their thing and the world, the world at the time was getting a little bit worse because of the behavior and the um, actions of the people at the time. And he saw Noah and his family as the sole representation of Christ, or pretty much at the time, God's righteousness. And it came to a point in time where God spoke to him and said like, okay, the world is, you know, is that getting worse? Everybody is so sinful and it's getting like, getting so out of control. I want you to build an ark because I'm going to send a flood that's going to cleanse the earth, right? And in Second Peter 2 verse 5, it also here talks about how Noah, not just a builder, was also a preacher of righteousness. I know in Genesis it doesn't really specifically say that Noah did not, I mean that Noah like was out there proclaiming or just like speaking about the flood that was coming. It mainly just said that like Noah pretty much did as, Noah pretty much did as what God um, had tasked him to do, essentially. But in Patriarchs and Prophets, I don't know why it expands on, um, on how Noah was this preacher of righteousness Expands on how Noah preached about repentance and salvation to the people, and she even writes how Noah even pleaded even after the ark's completion until the doors were closed. Right? While there are, because as we know in the Bible, because we can't really hide it, we can't. It's it's there. There will come a time where like the world will have to be you know burned right at the end of time. But at the same time, it does not exclude the fact that we also have a message of hope as well, right? That's also something that we cannot forget. And for Noah on his part, he wanted to make sure that, you know, there's something inevitable that's coming and he does not want anybody else to experience this as well. And then when you look at Abraham in Genesis 18, right? when Sodom and Gomorrah were pretty much due to be burned because of their wickedness and their sinfulness. Abraham pleaded with God, and he started off by saying, like, if there are at least 50 people 
that are righteous. Please spare the city. And God was like, okay. And then Abraham wanted to like push it a little bit, like, oh, okay, like maybe if there were just at least 45 people, you know, five less than what I asked for, will you spare the city? God said, okay. And then he goes again, it's like, if there were at least 30 people, right? If there were at least 30 people, will you spare the city? Can you please spare the city? And then he kind of keeps on going down until he reaches about like 10 people, right? Or maybe like a lot less from what he initially asked for, right? But at the end, we know that Sodom and Gomorrah were burned, but at the same time, Abraham, after hearing this, you know, Abraham could have just said, okay, yeah, they deserve it, you know? But for him, he felt that, you know, God, I know that you're merciful. You, there's, you are, you have like this heart of peace. You have this heart of, you know, redemption. Please just spare them as well, right? But then we go to um, Jonah, who was a prophet in, I think it's in the latter prophets or the major. But essentially, Jonah, this prophet, is tasked by God to essentially arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, cry out against it, for the wickedness has come up before me. And for Jonah, his displeasure with this assignment wasn't the fire and the brimstone that the city could face. In fact, it was the fact or the, the chance that there could be no fire and brimstone. And if we're gonna be reading like the Bible like pretty clearly, God didn't necessarily say the city was going to be destroyed explicitly. He said, he's just pretty much telling Jonah that the behavior of Nineveh has been put on notice for him. Like he's aware of what's going on. And he tasked Jonah by saying like, hey, I want you to go to the city and speak against their wickedness, right? But as the story goes, after Jonah has received these, has received these instructions, he goes to the opposite direction. And then fast forward later, after some turn of events where God is trying to like redirect his path, like, hey, you're like, you know, you're going the wrong way. And then Jonah, in one particular chapter, he has like this very lengthy prayer of just like reconciling his decision for God and just like, you know, okay, I'm gonna do this. So he goes to the city and essentially he preaches that in a certain amount of days, you know, God's wrath will be poured out upon you. But upon hearing this, the city eventually repents and the king actually of the city commands everybody to fast put on sackcloth as a way of just, you know, repenting and reconciling with what they have done. And the city is spared. And soon after Jonah pretty much leaves, pretty much has done his work, he waits outside for the city to be destroyed. And what's really, when I read um, in Jonah 4 verses 1 to 3, like maybe as a child, like it didn't really like register to me though. But as as an adult, when I read this, it it kind of it kind of threw me for a loop. Or like I remember reading this, and I actually put like my mouth, my hand to my mouth. Hey, this is what he's this is what he said, or what Jonah was basically expressing. So in Jonah four verses one to three, and it says, and it but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, was this, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore, therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. <laughs> You know, in the Old Testament, where it is notoriously accused of being a time where God enjoys destroying nations, enjoys destroying all kinds of groups of people, but here Jonah is confessing his frustration that the city wasn't destroyed. 
mainly frustrated by the fact that like, you know what the reason why I left, why I went the opposite direction? Because you didn't destroy the city, you're so abundant in mercy and love, and you know, you're gracious and you have like this insurmountable amount of patience, and you spoiled my fireworks. And at this time as well, like he kind of gets this experience of, you know, what it means to have compassion and what it means to kind of, it's kind of like this um, learning moment where as he's like waiting outside and just being all miserable and all that, he starts like, what's it called? In the Middle East or like in those times in the desert, you know, it's hot. And for him, he's just willing to just like stay around there until like he sees what he wants to see and he sees what he wants to happen. So this plant is pretty much grown as a shade for him. And Jonah is just um, relieved, he's thankful. But then in the middle of the night, God sends worms onto this plant and pretty much destroys the plant. And then later on, he just, he wakes up with the plant all destroyed and everything. And when Jonah and God like speak again, he kind of like turns it around and says like, you know, essentially God was just like pointing out by like saying how like, how can you have compassion? How can you not have compassion over millions of people and you have enough mercy for like just a single plant? No. And just looking at Jonah's task and what he pretty much said, what the Bible mentions of what he said, Jonah pretty much says that, like, you know, you're all gonna die in like 40 days, or like in, in this amount of days, essentially. But upon, but upon hearing this, the city actually repents. But on the side of Jonah, he does not like this because he thinks that you know, upon hearing what the city is like and how people have behaved there, he thinks that they deserve this so much and gets disappointed by not seeing anything like destroyed, right? And upon looking at these different um, stories and these different accounts from different characters, Noah being tasked with this um, preparation task of uh, preparing for the flood but also trying to warn people of what is coming. And then on the other side, we also have Abraham, who is aware of the destruction of the city, but is trying to plead for the, just to plead, to just spare the city if there are at least a certain amount of people who are righteous. But then on the other side, there's Jonah, who is tasked with this message of speaking against the wickedness of the city is aware that God is a merciful and loving God, does not want to do this because if he does go there and preach, he knows that the city will be spared. And this is something that he did not like. And it kind of makes me think about how, you know, messages of hellfire or like, you know, speaking about the damnation of the wicked and all that thing. You know, we have people on the street just like proclaiming, you know, and the times are coming, you know? Like, what if these people aren't exactly like hoping for destruction or anything? Because maybe they're just extremely concerned, you know? It's like, they just don't want any, anybody to just experience suffering in the end. But unfortunately, there are also some other people who like kind of take this opportunity to just use this message and just kind of bat it over people's heads and sometimes unconsciously it makes them feel like the people that they're preaching to is much lesser than they are because they have salvation and they don't and unless they repent they're going to be saved like no right but i believe that when we when it comes to the message that we are given as a church it must be handled with a level of tact as well which reminds me of when this um, this um, visiting professor came in and posed the question of the word of God being 
being a weapon or an instrument of peace. Right? Because it can be both depending on how you use it. And the message that we give can either bring healing or fear. And sometimes when we try to instill fear in trying to convert people, it does not breed a good foundation for the life of a Christian. I was reading an article about fear being a motivator in the workplace. And there was one quote that really caught my attention where how fear isn't really encouraged as a motivator because it usually breeds frustration. And it occurred to me that usually people who talk about you know, the end of time and trying to like prepare for the last days are probably frustrated individuals. Because everything around them that they see is like nobody is getting their act together, nobody is like taking anything seriously, so they take matters into their own hands to try to like push for this message of saying like, hey, you know, we get, you know, you're gonna die if like you're not gonna do anything, and it, and it kind of gets like spiritually, de- you get spiritually desperate, you know, and you start to compare your spirituality with theirs. It's like, hey, like this person's spirituality is not even remotely close to my spirituality. I need to make sure I need to straighten this person as much as possible. But when Christ was here on earth, he wasn't remembered like that. I mean, he did kind of, um, kind of made people upset, but mainly because he was doing things, uh, mainly like healing on the Sabbath, reaching out to the people that were forgotten. He wasn't remembered for somebody as an individual that was trying to uh, bring in all the hellfire, bring all like the fire and brimstone. And even so in his parables and in his um, messages, he still also like alluded to the end of time as well. But people weren't like scared or like, you know, fearful. Because even the disciples were asking like, okay, when are these things going to happen? You know, Jesus was that balanced. He knew what to say and when to say things as well. But at the end of the day, he was only remembered as an individual who brought hope and healing. And even in one of his first messages, when he was speaking out of the book of Isaiah, which was essentially talking about his mission, he came to save and like liberate those who were enslaved or, cap- or captive to bring sight to the blind and like heal people right? He did not come to condemn the world, but he came to save it, right? But you know, sometimes at our worst, sometimes we do get desperate and just, you know, maybe we do get frustrated of like, especially sometimes within our congregation of, you know, sometimes you just need to shake people up, you know, make them get serious. But what you do is just instill fear instead of hope as a Christian, you know? God did not give us a spirit of fear. Because at the end of the day, when you get to heaven, like, you're not going to, there's no, there's not going to be any fear because you're going to be very much happy and, like, at peace when you're in the presence of God, right? Of course, there's this um, fear of God, but it's the fear of this awe and reverence rather than dread and you know, being terrified. That's not what it is, though. Jesus was remembered as a representation of hope and redemption. What message are we remembered for? Because while Jesus was remembered for that, what about us? Because there are some people that I... I know that have left the church because the the church was just a place where, you know, you're gonna die if like these things are gonna happen. If you're not going to like straighten up, and all these things. And in some ways, it can be true, but it shouldn't be the thing that we should emphasize so much because there's so much more to the message that we are giving. And even today, because, you know, we are already faced with so much destruction and so much, you know, 
calamities all over the place though, right? In the book, in the Bible, it prophesies like how the world will just get even much worse. There'll be wars and everything. And the last thing that people want to hear from the church is saying that, you know, something much worse is going to happen. And it's like, you're missing out. You're, you're leaving out something in there, you know? Because the majority of Jesus' ministry was trying to bring this hope and try to reassure everybody that you don't have to do anything for your salvation because I did it for you. So maybe if you are have this message on your heart of talking about, you know, destruction of the wicked, you know, be considerate, but never leave out the love of God. Because he doesn't want you there. And it's not even for human beings. It was meant for the one who rebelled directly against God, knowing that God is the God of the universe, but thought that, you know what? I can be much better than this person, than this God. God doesn't want humanity to burn. He doesn't want humanity to be destroyed. We just have to choose God, knowing that he loves us just the way we, we are. And he can transform your life and he can turn your life around, right? And in all that is said, and in all that we do, even if it's a message of hellfire, never leave out his amazing grace. He loves you, he wants you to live with him forever and ever. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we just want to thank you for your gospel and your message. And sometimes the way that we convey the message can be a little bit um, pushy. We might get desperate and we sometimes get frustrated that to the point we start comparing ourselves to other people. But Lord, as we continue to witness for you and as we continue to grow in you, that you will continue to um, transform us as we walk with you. That instead of just judging other people and trying to forcibly convert people through fear, that we can just leave an impression of your love. So help us, Lord, to not use fear, but to use love as a way to spread your message. And I pray that all of us will choose to follow you, not out of fear, but out of love. We ask this all in Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you for your amazing grace. There's nothing else that we can do except to ex accept the gift that you have given to us, the gift of salvation. So help us to be ambassadors of hope rather than just trying to scare everybody. But help us, Lord, to be loving to those around us, to listen, to care for those around us. And at the same time, hope for your soon return. Thank you, Father, for hearing and answering your prayer. We ask this in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for that wonderful message. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for that message. And also, I would like to thank all the participants this morning. I cannot mention your name. You're so many. So just thank uh, the one who uh, led us the Garden of Prayer, the musicians, the uh, Vancouver Filipino Choir, the instrumentalist, praise him. Special music. Thank you very much. And this time we are going to our uh, fellowship meal. So I would like to invite all the visitors to join us and take the opportunity to know us more and we ask to know you more. This is the time. Before that, we have to pray first. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, we praise you today. We thank you for the message that we have, the food for thoughts, for spiritual life. Thank you for uh, the love that is unconditional for us. Thank you for all of this, Lord. And as we go down and share the food, the physical food for us, or prepared a group two, may you bless it, make it... Uh, as a nourishment, part of our body, and energize us today as we celebrate the Sabbath day. Bless this group that prepared the food, and bless us all today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, church, and let's join, and let's go downstairs to have the fellowship meal. Let's go out. Uh, in orderly manner. Thank you. God bless.